It is the fact that there is no suggestion in the creation story that the earth, once it was created, was set in motion, very much to the contrary. Moses' account has the earth as the focus of everything. The first verse of Genesis says, In the beginning God made heaven and earth. What follows is his preparing the earth for the creation of Adam. Nothing is more unmistakable than that the sun and moon and stars are subordinate and subservient to the earth. The text continues, And God said, Let there be lights made in the firmament of heaven to divide the day and the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, to shine in the firmament of heaven and to give light upon the earth. And so it was done. And God made two great lights, a greater light to rule the day, and a lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And he set them in the firmament of heaven to shine upon the earth, and to rule the day and the night, and to divide the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. The book of Genesis, the first chapter, verses 14 to 19. No one will deny that the notion that the earth moves in an orbit around the sun is at complete variance with what is said here. I am speaking of the manner in which Moses visualizes for us the physical order which God establishes as he proceeds. It is unquestionably subversive of Moses' presentation to imagine that the earth was formed by being hurled off the sun or some larger star by some kind of explosion or eruption, that the earth with the other planets can be thought of as hardly more than cosmic debris, as so much errant shrapnel. In the scriptural account, God spends five days making a place for Adam to live. To make the universe and all its furniture, as Moses calls it, required no effort from God. Making the whole great mechanism was as easy as making a single flower or a wisp of air. He really did not need to rest on the seventh day. This is another anthropomorphism. God took six days to make the earth to teach us to give him the seventh, and to establish the week as an everlasting memorial to this prodigious act. The creation of Adam on the sixth day is the culmination of the work. And once Adam is created, we are going to see that God concerns himself with his moral formation. In a word, man, in the person of Adam, is the subject of creation and man's moral fulfillment. In considering whether the earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around the earth, therefore, we must not allow the hypotheses of scientists to take precedence over explicit revelations of the Father. The primary purpose of man's existence is spiritual. Though Adam and his children were created on earth, and though they must be on earth to live their natural lives, they were not created merely to live and die like the animals of the earth. They were and are created for an everlasting life their life on earth being temporary and preparatory, the first phase of their unending existence. Unlike the animals, man is mainly a spiritual being, as the scripture says. And God said, Let us make man to our image and likeness, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and the beasts, and the whole earth, and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. 
And God created man to his own image. To the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. The book of Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27. We can state two biblical truths with the certitude of faith. The first is that being omnipotent, our all-holy God can do whatever he judges it expedient and desirable to do. As I observed to you some weeks ago, in the realm of ontology, the possible is determined by what God does. With reference to the divine capability, the only impossible thing is a contradiction in terms, which is to say, the only thing God cannot do is what cannot be done, such as to make a square circle. Thus there is no technical or logistical problem for God to hang the earth on nothing, as Job says. The book of Job, the 26th chapter, the 7th verse. The second sacred truth is that the purpose of the making of the whole universe is the salvation and everlasting beatitude of man. For the universe without man, for all its immensity and splendor, is just matter without a reason for existing. According to modern science, the universe neither has nor needs a reason for existing, other than to be the object of its investigation and infatuation and worship. It is just an accident, and man is merely part of the accident. According to modern science in general, and modern astronomy in particular, the material universe is more important than man. And why should the universe be judged of greater importance than man? The reason is that it is bigger and more interesting, and it is one of a kind whereas man is small, and he is apparently infinitely multiple. There are already too many of him. For modern science, man is not important. He is not as important as certain kinds of rodents and birds, because his number increases, despite all efforts taken hitherto for, to curtail his multiplication whereas the aforementioned creatures are in danger of extinction. Science is thoroughly materialist, as it should be, for it is the study of the physical universe in all its parts, not excluding the physical side of man. But modern science is thoroughly materialistic, acknowledging the existence of nothing which it cannot measure or weigh, or probe, or experiment with. And modern science is atheistic. Anything which modern science cannot see or find does not exist. And because God is a pure spirit who does not come under its scrutiny, he does not exist. The same goes for the soul of man which is also a purely spiritual entity. Since the soul cannot be discerned by their super-expensive, super-computerized, super-sophisticated instruments, it simply does not exist. Hence, for modern science, as for evolution, man is just another species of animal, or, more properly, he is a specimen the logical result has followed. Modern science worships the universe because of its vastness and wondrousness and its inexhaustible mysteries. Besides, modern science worships itself, being totally enraptured with its achievements. Modern scientists see themselves as both the priests and the guardians of all reality, 
all that is real being all that they say exists. It is their role to lead all lesser beings in praise and adoration of the universe. Also, they have the bounden duty to protect and administer it. Thus, in its mad narcissism, modern science has lost all conception of what it is for. It is totally amoral, having concluded that, in the physical order, that which is scientifically possible is perfectly moral. No longer is it merely the humble, inquiring, dutiful handmaid of philosophy and theology and healing. It has become Dr. Frankenstein. Now it presumes to determine what part of the physical universe deserve to live and what part should be expended. Modern science has given us safe abortion, safe sex, natural family planning, the contraceptive pill, the abortion pill, artificial insemination, fertilization in vitro, mind alteration, and the mind-controlled biochip, euthanasia, and assisted suicide, the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, the neutron bomb, chemical and biological warfare, and who knows what other dreadful devices which are available if the price is right. By now I can imagine that you, dear listener, are saying something like this. The earth hanging stationary in space the sun encircling the earth every day, is this fellow out of his gourd or what? To which I reply, Remember, sir, that I told you that we would be speaking of popular misapprehensions. Before you say another word, answer me this. Is it not true that you have taken the heliocentric theory on faith that it never entered your mind that what your high school science teacher was telling you might not be the fact? And is it not also true that he neglected to mention that there is a contrary view, geocentrism? This is the day when you must begin to have sober doubts about the theory which has the earth spinning on its so-called axis a thousand miles an hour, and whirling through space some 18,000 miles an hour. Hence everything on earth is moving somewhere in the neighborhood of 19,000 miles an hour. And yet we have days on which there is not the slightest breeze. We are told, and who are we to question, that this is the way it is, that it has all been figured out mathematically so it is bound to be right. You must admit, dear sir, it is quite something to believe. I conclude until the next program by remarking that heliocentrism is just a theory. There is no proof of it whatsoever. Science has achieved mind-boggling feats, but believe it or not, it has never discovered a way to prove that the earth moves in any way whatsoever, not so much as an inch. <laughs>